Sans Pants Radio, Australia's most cowardly podcast network. This is News Fighters. Where we fight the news so you don't have to. With Dylan Behan. Hello, fighters. Welcome to News Fighters for today, Tuesday, January the 19th, 2021. I'm your host, Dylan Bain, and this week is the week in which America inaugurates a new president. Hopefully. So stick around later for my chat with Chaz Lichardello from Planet America and The Chaser, in which we discuss Trump's legacy and Biden's challenges ahead. So, yeah, I, I suspect that we will look through, look at Trump with rose colored glasses as well. OK, let's start the show with a world news roundup and let's have a look at what the ABC and SBS World News have been covering this past week. The UK has recorded its deadliest day of the pandemic. China has recorded its biggest daily jump in COVID-19 cases in more than five months. Germany recorded almost 900 more deaths yesterday. The United States continues creeping towards 400,000 coronavirus deaths. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, but, but moving on, uh, the commercial TV news here in Australia uh, has had a slightly different focus this week. The global fight to save Joe the Pigeon facing the death penalty for breaching biosecurity laws. The pigeon, who survived a 15,000 kilometre journey from the US to Australia, is being sentenced to death after breaching quarantine protocols. The story ruffling feathers around the world. The Melbourne man who found Joe has been ordered to catch the bird so it can be euthanised. Yes, without human immigrants coming into Australia, the media has finally had to turn on our undocumented bird migrants. Look at them. Flying into our country without passports. They don't even give their full names to uh, Border Force. I hear some of them even throw their children overboard out of their bird's nests. So, what is to be done with Joe, the dirty coo-jumping pigeon? Well, Sunrise has one solution. Surely yeah. we can put it in hotel quarantine. We seem to have a few of those, yeah. even in the outback. What do you reckon? I would have thought, can we get the Prime Minister on the phone? Oh, come on, Sunrise. You don't just expect the acting Prime Minister to get up at a press conference and discuss this stupid, insignificant little case of a lost pigeon, do you? Oh, no, wait, of course he did. But if Joe has come uh, in, a, in a way that uh, has not uh, met our strict biosecurity measures, then uh, bad luck, Joe. Either fly home or face the consequences. Yes, with Scott Morrison away on holidays last week, we had Nationals leader Michael McCormack step up to tackle the big issues. Which brings us to our new segment... Michael McCormack. And the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad... Week. Yes, so on Monday, Michael McCormack started the week by victim-blaming unemployed people while also claiming... Bosses hate JobKeeper? The acting Prime Minister has come under fire on his first day in the job after saying JobKeeper recipients want the wage subsidy cut back. Accusing some Australians of rejecting job offers to stay on benefits. Have been sitting on the couch and being, you know, dare I say, uh, lounge lizards for, uh, for too long. The acting Prime Minister is also claiming businesses want JobKeeper to end. Start at A, accountants, and you could work right through to Z, zoos. They're telling me that JobKeeper uh, and, and the other arrangements that we have in place uh, need to be tapered off. Yes, he's right. If there's one thing all the business owners of Australia hate, it's free money from the government keeping them afloat. And also, every unemployed person I know thinks their payments are just too damn high. They need them lowered so they can get off the couch. OK, so that was Monday. And the very next day, he was being criticised over his views on, you guessed it, race relations. Michael McCormack has been heavily criticised for comparing last week's US Capitol riot, aiming to overturn the presidential election result, with last year's Black Lives Matter protests against racially motivated violence and police brutality. It is unfortunate that uh, we have seen the events at Capitol that uh, kill that we've, we've seen in, uh, in, in recent uh, days. It, uh, it, it, similar to those uh, race riots that we saw around the country last year. These these are unfortunate events and of course uh, many people don't don't remember how you rode the horse they remember how you dismount the horse okay wait what what are you trying to say there let's let's break that down are you trying to say donald trump inspiring an insurrection at the u.s capitol is somehow like someone getting off a horse badly and if so what does that make donald trump a a, a rodeo clown and does that make american democracy like a horse? 
I'm really very confused, but somehow not as confused as Michael McCormack was when it came to saying what the Black Lives Matter protests were like. The Black Lives Matter protests, uh, as at about mid last year, had cost 19 lives. That's 19 lives that should not have been lost. Now, I'm not going to apologise because I said that, uh, that violence in any form should not happen from a protest. And irrespective of what the, the uh, agenda of that protest was, the fact is there was violence. OK, first of all, I had never heard this figure that Black Lives Matter protests had cost 19 lives before until moments ago when I found it in the Wikipedia article on the Black Lives Matter protests in the disputed section on deaths. And as for this... The fact is... There was violence. Uh, I'm sorry, who did the violence at the Black Lives Matter protests in Australia last June? Police pepper spraying protesters at Sydney Central Station. Police have used pepper spray on a number of protesters at Sydney's main railway station as they tried to break up a crowd following a largely peaceful Black Lives Matter event in the CBD. And hey, Michael, uh, here's a little hint that your week filling in for your boss isn't going so well. Uh, it's when on your second day you got condemned by this little organisation called... Amnesty International. Acting Prime Minister Michael McCormack has dismissed criticism from a leading human rights organisation and repeated comments described as deeply offensive. Representatives from Amnesty International have called on Mr McCormack to withdraw his remarks. But thankfully, McCormack decided to use a little softer language to try and calm the situation. Well, Amnesty International and, and, and others... And I appreciate there are a lot of people out there who are being a bit bleeding hard about this and who are confecting outrage, but they should know that those lives matter too. All lives matter. Whoa! Was that our Deputy Prime Minister parroting a white supremacist catchphrase? Look, to be fair, I'm not entirely sure McCormack knew what he was doing there. He is, he is the kind of a guy who would accidentally attend a KKK meeting thinking it was the Corn Cultivators Cooperative and he was there to support Australian corn farmers. So from there, Michael McCormack tried to dig upwards by tying his argument to World War I and II veterans for some reason. All lives matter. People shouldn't have to go to a protest and lose their life. There are 67 names on the War Memorial Honour Board behind us who went to a war to fight for a freer, a freer society in the future. So... You know, those 102,000 names on the War Memorial in Canberra, they went to war so that we could have free speech. Let's face it, in Australia we've uh, gone to two world wars so that people can uh, speak freely, can, so that they can have that democratic right of free speech. Again, Michael McCormack, we don't have free speech in this country enshrined in a Bill of Rights or in our Constitution. Nobody is constitutionally entitled to free speech in this country as you might remember from this incident last September. Police in Victoria are, un are under fire for placing a pregnant mum in handcuffs following a post on Facebook urging Search people to attend an anti-lockdown yeah, protest. Yeah. The woman could face up to 15 years in jail. Yes, it turns out if only she'd been a coalition MP posting conspiracy theories and misinformation, that would have been absolutely fine. Coalition MPs George Christensen and Craig Kelly have repeatedly shared conspiracy theories on social media about COVID-19. If I'm not in favour of censorship uh, for, uh, for Twitter, then why would I be wanting to censor George Christensen? And so McCormack defended his MPs by saying, well, truth doesn't exist anyway, who cares? What kind of censure is there for party members who may be spreading misinformation? Well, again, I mean, facts sometimes are contentious. You might look out there and say the sky is blue and I can see from here that it's grey, but if we go out from under this rotunda, there are probably blue patches. I mean, there are a lot of subjective things. That's funny, Michael McCormack, because all I see is uh, grey skies ahead for your leadership. Yes, this was the week that Michael McCormack decisively proved his commitment to free speech by consistently and enthusiastically putting his foot in his own mouth time and time again. And I have to say, the biggest difference I noticed between Scott Morrison and Michael McCormack's leadership styles uh, was that McCormack uh, actually loudly vocalised the coalition's racist dog-whistling, fact-denying, out-of-touch victim-blaming and conspiracy theory-encouraging, while Scott Morrison manages to tone it down a little. So, after this exhausting week, whew, I never thought I'd say this, but... <laughs> Bring back Scott Morrison, please.
Welcome back to News Fighters. Now, I don't know if you heard, but uh, Donald Trump lost the US election. So that means Joe Biden is being inaugurated as the United States 46th president this week. So I thought now would be the perfect time to call up my old mate from the Chaser Days, Chaz Lichardello, who's currently the co-host of the ABC show Planet America and the podcast Pep, to talk about what the hell is going to happen in America. Enjoy. First of all, uh, welcome to News Fighters. Um, Planet America has been off since uh, November. Yes. Uh, well, there'd be much to talk about since then. Yeah. When's, yeah. The, when's the show coming back? We have a, a special because inauguration is happening at 3 a.m. We think it's not a smart idea to cover that live. So, <laughs> we're, so we're doing a show on, on the night before and then we're doing a show on the Friday after and then after that. It's every week on Friday. Uh, when are you going to sleep between the <laughs> the show at <laughs> but the night before and the show on the Friday? <laughs> I, if if American politics is anything like it's been for the last few weeks, I won't be able to sleep during that two <laughs> two day period because I'll just be in a fetal position, rocking back and forth. Uh, so are you coming back with the two show? You're going to have the fireside chat this year and the regular show as well, and the podcast. Are you doing all three? Definitely doing the podcast. That's the most important bit, as you, I hope yes. you agree. Um, yep, yep. But, uh, um, the shows are just going to be on Friday. We're not going to do the Wednesday show because Wednesday show is ABC TV, and I don't think they were necessarily convinced that there would be a mass market for American politics in a non-election year. Now, if they, I think they're probably wrong, but <laughs> having said that, I've decided to go get a dog, so I'm happy to not do two shows a week this year. We'll just do the news, the news channel show on Friday, and the rest of the week I'm going to play play with my dog. I, I can I guess what sort of dog it is? I think you can. <laughs> is it a whippet? You got it. For those who don't know why you you hit it spot on, I've been obsessed with whippets as long as Dylan's known me. In fact, I've been obsessed with whippets since I was 14. There's something for a shrink there, but I just love whippets and I've had all these reasons and well, some would say excuses why I couldn't get a whippet. But finally, all the all the dots have all lined up in a row and I've finally bitten the bullet and got myself a whippet. Uh, <laughs> yes. And yes, and great to hear the podcast will be coming back. Uh, congratulations Definitely. on 50 episodes. Um, now it's changed names. Do you want to talk us through it was called? <laughs> now this is just an extracurricular thing you do. This is nothing. Yeah. This is in no way connected to the Planet America TV show, correct? Oh, no, no, absolutely not. Even though when we started it, we called it the Planet America podcast. I assure you it has nothing to do with Planet America because the ABC who own the Planet America name have told us that we're not allowed to do a podcast. So, therefore, it's not the Planet America podcast. Now it's PEP, which doesn't stand for Planet Extra podcast, which we also called at one point in time, because they own the, the, the word planet as well. It's just PEP. It's just you know, it's about invigoration as much as anything else. That's all. I, I had no idea ABC owns the entire word planet. Well, let's put it this way. They, they threatened to take me to court based on the on the ownership of the word planet. Now, I could challenge it in court, but I prefer just to call it pet. I, th- I, I assumed it would be in the ABC's best interest to have, ex- you know, extra marketing for the show, but clearly they don't want that. <laughs> you, would, you would think that, Dylan, and I, and I know that you have some stories, and I certainly <laughs> have some stories about the ABC. They don't necessarily work in their own interests all the time. <laughs> they work in mysterious ways, like the Lord. Um, And there was something I heard you talking about on PEP. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but I think you guys touched on, and we'll get into the the, the, the American politics stuff now, I guess, which is um, uh, Trump's legacy. Now, uh, there's something I thought about this week, which was George W. Bush's legacy has has rosened, uh, uh, rosened uh, got more rosy with time. Yeah. Now people remember yeah. him for combating malaria and fighting AIDS in mm. developing countries. And even someone like Nixon, people go, oh, he started the EPA. You know, so even yeah. these deeply flawed presidents, sometimes have a non-controversial kind of universally admired legacy. I cannot mm. think what Trump's will be. Can you, can you think of anything 20 years from now people might be, oh, yeah, Trump did something good? I actually do think. I do think that Trump will be rosened as, as yes, well, Rose. just like the rest of <laughs> us. I'm not sure he's ever going to reach 
like the, the, the same kind of uh, pet status that George W. Bush has for Democrats under Trump. Yes. So I think that I think that he'll definitely be seen as better than the current guy in 10 years' time. And the reason why is there's a couple of things. In terms of things that he has achieved, well, at the very least, they came up with a vaccine under him for True. COVID. That's one thing. True. Um, depending on what happens with climate change, the one thing which hasn't been talked about enough, including actually by us, to be honest, is there's been a lot of stuff happening with nuclear power under Trump. No one ever talks about it. And if it ever actually happens, if it ever actually comes off that we, we do get a proper alternative energy structure with lots of solar power and lots of wind power and lots of nuclear power, it's probably going to be because of the technologies that were fast-tracked under the Trump administration, Interesting. which didn't bear fruit for another five or ten years. But the main reason I think people look back on him, well, I didn't say positively, but more positively yes, than they are now. They do now, yep, yep. Yeah, is because I think the guys who are coming after him are going to be much nastier and much smarter. And the, like I think uh, your Josh Hawley's and your Tom Cotton's, those kinds of guys are going to do the populism just like Trump did. But the difference is, and they're going to do the racism and they're mm-hmm. probably going to do the militarism as well. That's one thing which is different, which I think people look back fondly with Trump. He doesn't want to start wars. True, true. He's not going out of his way trying to start wars. And I think Tom Cotton is going to go out of his way to try and start wars. If he's the next president, people will look back on Trump fondly in that regard, I think. And I I also think just the fact that Trump talked the talk a lot, but all he really wanted to do was get lots of likes on Twitter. That's Mm. all he wanted. Because some of these other guys, they're going to want to achieve some things that I don't think a lot of people are going to be happy with. So, yeah, I I suspect that we will look look at Trump with rose-coloured glasses as well. Um, and then on the Democratic side, uh, Biden's cabinet slowly been leaking out, and I'm amazed that um, all these all his competitors, except for Mayor Pete, who got the prize role of um, transportation secretary, <laughs> y- y- Yang, Klobuchar, Bernie, Beto O'Rourke, none of them got a spot in the cabinet. Is this a case of him trying to keep your enemies away, like so they don't get any limelight the next four years and set up set up Kamala? Or well, I think part of the problem is that a lot of them are senators. And he needs every senator he can get at the moment because he's, he's got yep, a bare, yep. ma- bare majority. So that's the first problem. I, I still think, actually, to this day, I think, I said this on the podcast at the end of last year and D- Dr. Dave thought I was insane. But to this day, I reckon if they had either gotten a proper majority or they had missed out on the majority, then I reckon he would have made Bernie Sanders, he would put Bernie Sanders in his cabinet. But, but, uh, but having said that, because he seems to have a very strong relationship with Bernie Sanders, mm. like a personal relationship, but um, but he just can't afford to lose any senators at the mm. moment. Especially a lot of these senators are in states with Republican governors, so they would be replaced by Republican replacements. So he, he can't afford that. Um, Someone like Beto O'Rourke, say, Beto, I just saw is going to teach teach at University of Texas now. Like he hasn't got a lot on <laughs> Beto. <laughs> that is true. That is true. It seems to me that Biden. Basically, I'm not sure it's that he's trying to exclude the people he ran against. I think it's more the, cha- the case. You look at the people he's appointed; they're all these old mates from the Obama administration. Mm-hmm. I think I think Biden just wants people he can trust. That makes sense. He's in for a tough four years. I think. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to have people who he can believe in. I should say, by the way, Andrew Yang. I don't know if you know this. Yes, is already going for mayor of New York. I was which, about to, I was about to get to that. I, I, did you see the yeah, launch yeah. the launch the launch video f- to launch his campaign? This is how dystopian America is right now. It was uh, directed by Darren Aronofsky, who did Requiem for a Dream. It's like the middle of winter in New York, and everyone's wearing masks, saying, "Please save us." It's very very dystopian campaign launch video. <laughs> It is, but that is that's Andrew Yang's style. He's he's always he's always been a little bit uh, ambivalent between being mega pessimistic and hopeful at the same time. And, and and I actually think this is the best thing that can happen to him. I think he'd be much better being the mayor of New York than transportation secretary. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but like that's that's genuine leverage for another presidential run, say in ten years' time, if he pulls it off. And let's face it. Bill de Blasio is not the most well-loved <laughs> mayor, so he's probably in a pretty but, good position. But is, is it a poison chalice? I, I researched, I don't think any New York mayor's ever become president. Is he just setting himself up to be the next Rudy Giuliani here? 
<laughs> well, it's possible. I, I, I mean, I hope for his sanity's sake that he's not the next Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, like, but yeah, let, let, let's face it. There is only one president every four to eight years, so the chances aren't great. And if you're not going to be president, being mayor of New York isn't a bad. That's not. That's not a bad fallback. So uh, I think he's looking okay. And in terms of, so we've got Biden's inauguration this, this, this week. We'll all be up late. Uh, the next four years, any, any surprises we're expecting or is it going, or is planet America going to get very boring all of a sudden, or, or is there <laughs> some, some big things we should be keeping an eye on or looking out for? American politics never, ever gets boring. <laughs> I can tell you that there's the crazies are always there. <laughs> they never go away. Um, I think that we can, almost certainly expect uh, the Republicans to win the House in 2022, at the very least, possibly the Senate as well, but that doesn't matter. Just the, the Congress is all they need. And when they do, the debt ceiling, the debt ceiling is going to be due sometime in that two-year period. I would expect the Republicans to not allow uh, Biden to... So for those who don't know what I'm talking about, America has a strange situation where when they have, they have an arbitrary amount of national debt they're allowed to have. And at, that, and at some point in time, they just say, we're not paying it back anymore. Not unless you pass a bill to raise the debt ceiling. We've reached the, the amount, that amount of debt. We're not paying it back anymore. That doesn't mean you don't owe the money. Mm. That just means not paying it back. And if they hit the debt ceiling and the Republicans don't let them lift the debt ceiling anymore, I'll tell you what happens. The entire country goes into default. And if the entire country goes into default, then they're going to lift, interest rates will go through the roof. The whole place, there'll be a massive recession, like a, like mm. a 2008 style recession all over again. The whole place is going to go nuts. And the Republicans will, if they've been cynical, they will like that because that means they will win the 2024 election in their canter because people mm. will blame Joe Biden. So that, I'll tell you right now, that is going to be, over the next four years, the biggest moment. When the debt ceiling is hit, probably around 2023, then what are the Republicans who by that stage will own Congress? What are they going to do? And I think in 10 years' time, when we look back at this period, that will be the pivotal moment to, to, to determine whether America really goes off the rails. Yeah. So um, and that's, a little, that's a little way away at the moment. But, um, yeah, things will build towards that uh, in many ways, the same way they did, like Obama, his last six years, he basically couldn't get much done either because he didn't have yeah. the House or the Senate. Total. Basically, Joe Biden has three bills because he's not going to be able to get rid of the filibuster. The filibuster means you need 60 votes to get anything through the Senate. Mm -hmm. He's not going to get rid of the filibuster because there are some conservative Democrats who won't let him get rid of it, which means that he can't pass anything, even though he holds the Senate, unless he can do it with 50 votes. There's one bill every year that allows you to pass things with 50 votes. It's a process called reconciliation, yep, which yep. when you pass the budget, you can add stuff to it. Now, there's all kinds of conditions. I won't bore you with it. Mm -hmm. But basically, they can do one this year. They can do one next year. And in anticipation of the election at the end of 2022, they can do one for the year after. They can pass a budget ahead of time. And if they can't get stuff done in those three bills, they're screwed. If they can do enough to win people over, then maybe he might have another breath after the 2022 elections. But um, it's going to be interesting. Those three bills are what it's going to be all about. Next two years, about those three bills. I'll mm -hmm. tell you that right now. And famously, yeah. Obama basically just did uh, the Affordable Care Act and then he ran yeah. out of time. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> um, on to more important things. Your Instagram, Baby Got Snack, has not been <laughs> updated since 2018. Do you want to fill people oh, in on your in, in on this and and when is yes. when is it coming back? Like baby got snack is my pride and joy. Um, it, 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 yeah, my Instagram account. For those who know me in real in the real world, all I do is eat snacks. Oh, that is yes. my love. We, my we, love had a, actually... we had a snack table on all the Chaser shows, and it was always <laughs> overflowing with whatever we could find at the at the weird import Asian supermarkets and convenience stores. Yeah. It was a, a bevy exactly. of delights. It was a buffet. Exactly. And so, yeah, and so I thought to myself, I, I really should share this important resource with the wider community. So mm. I started once or twice a week reviewing my favourite snack at, at that particular moment on the Baby Got Snack on Instagram. 
And uh, it has been, when we got into election mode, which was after 2018, and we were doing two shows a week and just constantly, constantly um, working with Play America, I just didn't have the time to put, to give the snack world the attention it needed. And so I, I, so I didn't update it. But uh, this year, only one show a week, we're cruising a snack's little bit. So back. I Snack's coming back. And the next next week or two, I will bring back baby the snack. All right. I'll... I'll- I'll give you my top three and I want your reactions yeah. and then I've got want your top three or however many you can manage. So this is, okay. these are my okay. favorites at the moment. I've got okay. the cucumber Pringles. Have you had this? Yes. They're I incredible. have had them. They are very solid. I agree. I agree that the taste is actually, that's one of those rare examples where not only does it taste like it says, mm. but it also tastes nice. Because mm. usually when, it, when it, they taste like they say, that's revolting. But in this case, it's pretty good. I agree. Uh, se- second, uh, I don't know if you've seen these. They're from Korea. They're very hard to find. They're turtle cinnamon chips. Have you seen these? I have not all? seen them. If you I see these, there's a picture. Them. There's a picture of like a turtle reading a newspaper or something on the cover. It's very weird. It's they're they're like cinnamon toast crunch, the breakfast cereal. They're they're a they're a, like a biscuit chip thing. Incredible. Okay. And my my okay. favorite at the moment is the uh, curry twisties from Malaysia. Have you seen these? I have seen the curry twist. I haven't. I haven't had them yet. They're very. So good. that's something for me to get. Okay. Well, look, you've given me two things to review for Baby Got Snack right there. So, right. so I, I'm, I'm especially going to get the details for the turtle cinnamon chips because I haven't heard of them. So I'm going right. to need some help finding them. Strathfield's good. Any my, Korean neighbourhood's good. <laughs> my favourite at the moment is not. It's not a new snack. This has been around for a long time, but just not available in Australia so much. Mm-hmm. Is La Croix mineral water. Have you had much La Croix? Oh, I cannot I've not seen it anywhere in Australia. Is it is it possible yeah. to get? Is it possible? Yes, yes. If I, I am gonna I am gonna advertise on your on your <laughs> podcast, but for something that I get no money out of, and that is <laughs> Redfern Convenience Store, if you're in Sydney, yes, is the place to go for La Croix. I'm addicted to it at the moment. I, I've actually subtly been in the podcast using different flavors of La Croix to drink every single time. It's um what, yeah, what's so the best flavor? Gonna, what's what's the top flavor do you recommend? For me, passion fruit. I love the passion fruit La Croix. Interesting. Very, very good. But they're but they're, they're all they're all winners, Dill. They really are <laughs> it's great. until I have the, the, the turtle chips, that they are my favorite snack at the moment. So yeah. But Incredible. I'm gonna start off I think with um the birthday yep. cake golden gay time and they're revolting. Oh yeah. But they're just very funny. <laughs> So we'll start off with that. that. That'll be my first snack back. Birthday cake, golden mentor. Oh my goodness. Sounds incredible. <laughs> um, all right. We'll leave it there, Chaz. Thanks so much for your time. It's been great to catch up. Anytime, and, Dill. Anytime and Dill. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah. The hardest working man in show business, news business. I'm not sure. Always, Most always, inspiring, always <laughs> inspiring in terms of his dedication to, to work and, and lack of lack of dedication to sleep, I have to say. <laughs> When you don't have talent, you're gonna get get done somehow, Dale. Yeah. <laughs> always got to always got to work hard. <laughs> right. All right. Thanks, Chaz. Thanks, Thanks again. Okay, that's News Fighters for today, January the nineteenth, twenty twenty one. News Fighters is written, presented, and produced by me, Dylan Bain, for Sans Pants Radio. A big thank you to Chaz Lichardello for stopping by. If you want to hear an extended version of our chat, as well as monthly bonus episodes, subscribe to Sans Pants Plus for US $5 a month at sanspantsradio.com slash plus. Don't forget, uh, you can also watch this show on YouTube. Don't forget to like us on Twitter and Facebook and write us a review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. Keep fighting. We'll be back next week. And bye for now. This is News Fighters, where we fight the news so you don't have to.